All right, welcome everybody to another installment of the OSPO Working Group. Uh, I am Gary White. I will be facilitating today's session. And we have a little bit of space on the agenda, so if you think of something while we're talking about the couple items I chucked on there, feel free to chuck it in there and we can talk about it. So I thought the first thing worth mentioning on this agenda is that uh, Linux Member Summit is next week. There's a couple of interesting talks that you can find on the Open Schedule site. If you're going to be at Linux Member Summit, I tried to highlight things that are chaos adjacent. So there's a lot about open source supply chain and uh, licensing. Uh, there's a lot. There's a couple of talks that are coming from myself and from Don, where we're talking about forked communities, uh, relicensing, and community impact. How it changes a community for relicensing to happen in a community in a product that people depend on. Uh, definitely has happened a couple of times this year. And then there's a panel discussion between myself, Don, uh, Georg, and Emma Irwin, where we're going to talk about reducing your risk with uh, viability. It, I have officially met my quota of talking about viability at least once per every meeting that I come to for chaos, this meeting. And I thought I'd open up that um, the fact that we're seeing a lot of those talks around licensing, around software supply chains, and just kind of talk a little bit about what we're doing at Verizon and maybe stir a little conversation on how that's happening at other organizations. Um, we're looking at viability, um, obviously that's part of why I'm here, as a way to reduce the risk of the software that we ingest and the software that we use over time. So we take metrics uh, that we can get with the context of knowing that there's some organizations that we already vendor from, there's some organizations that we don't want a vendor from, there's some organizations that we would rather not use any of their code if we can, and then make decisions about uh, whether or not strategically it's a good fit, whether or not it's well adopted by a community, whether or not we see enough activity in the project that we consider it to be enterprise grade. And that's one way that we're trying to shore up our software supply chain with viability. Uh, there's plenty of other, uh, s 2 c 2 f is an open standard that we're looking to adopt within our organization. We have support from our legal team for licensing that we partner with them to get their opinion on different ways that people can use software. And then the licensing that would uh, apply to any particular way to use software. So if we're putting it on a mobile application or if we're putting it on an internal server or if we're putting it in some server that's facing externally, there's different implications of what we would do and what we would recommend from the OSPO point of view. So I thought uh, that would be a good place to start just kind of talking about the things that seem to be happening at the member summit, things that seem to be the focus of a lot of discussion and kind of bring it to you to this uh, forum, to you guys to talk about it. What's going on in your organization? How are you approaching the software supply chain and licensing? Are you even thinking about this at all? Or are you looking to come to this meeting and get some tips on how to get started? Really, any discussion that folks might want to have about this topic, I'd be happy to kind of facilitate here. Or we don't have to talk about it at all. If nobody has anything to say, nothing to contribute, we don't have to. Okay, I'm going to take that as uh, not too much conversation regarding our supply chains right now. We're thinking about our uh, software supply chain, or at least things we don't want to talk about in this meeting. So um, maybe uh, just jump to this next piece here. I was thinking about another piece of what we're doing here at Verizon might be interesting and stir some discussion with regards to viability and with software supply chains, uh, obsolescence. Um, this is something that I don't see necessarily reflected directly in any chaos metrics, because I think it is highly contextual to an organization, how much uh, you might care about something like obsolescence, which if you're looking at it from a very bare bones point of view, this can just be like the age of all of the components that you're using in a software stack. So you may say that uh, this is obsolete because we should not be using components that are uh, 18 years old or 10 years old or five years old. And setting those thresholds for different organizations of different application portfolios has been helpful for us as an organization to 
like have a leading indicator for security campaigns, for example. So instead of waiting for CVEs to come up and around, we look at the age of versions for components that we use and try to approach it from a place of maybe we don't uh, use things that are this old, or at least if there's a more recent version, we try to put that in a risk profile that incentivizes folks to actually take action against using those components. There's like a lot more that I can dig into there, but I just wanted to open with this is one way that we're also de-risking our software supply chain is we're looking at the age of these components. And I don't know if anybody in other organizations is thinking about doing things like this. Maybe this is something that belongs in a longer conversation about metrics in chaos, but I thought it was an interesting enough topic that we could, we, I could bring it up and get some thoughts. How do people feel about that idea? How are people maybe using this in their own organizations? Yeah, go ahead, David. I was, uh, when you mentioned obsolescence is like, what is the reason of it? Because in we were discussing, so I'm in Penn University and we were discussing that recently on things like when funding stops for a particular piece of open source project, software that we are creating and there's no means to maintain it. Um, is that, does it count as well as obsolescence or that will be as a different category? Yeah, I think it can, right? It's, it's, this is one metric that can help tell the story of what is happening with a particular version or a particular component. If you have a, um, project that you depend on in an organization that isn't being funded appropriately, either, uh, you're writing it and you're not able to continue funding it or it's something that you depend on that maybe we should be throwing resources at to help maintain an open source community. Um, obsolescence can be a very understandable leading indicator for a lot of folks who maybe aren't super familiar with open source. Uh, if they see this dependency has not been changed, updated, there's no immediately available version past the one that was published 15 years ago or five years ago, or even a couple of months ago, that for different application portfolios and different risk tolerances can change how they view the stability of a given component. And so when you start collecting the age of all of the things that are in use, uh, lib years is an associated metric with this that it collects the age of all the dependencies for the top level dependencies you have. But I think framing it as across your portfolio, what's the makeup of the age you have is kind of an interesting study into telling a story like what you just mentioned, where is it something that's not maintained anymore? Is it something that we are not using the most recent version of it? Why are we not using the most recent version of it? Uh, and this is one way that you can find those indicators and start to tell that story. Does that make sense? Like it's, uh, yes, it's but, intentionally uh, not that directed as we know this isn't maintained, but we know that it's old. So when you mention the thing, like it's like obsessing that you haven't updated something or something hasn't been updated, so you haven't used it. But if you are the producer of that thing, is that also, if you are the one in charge of developing that tool, yeah, is that you, you will also classify it as obsolescence, or I mean, or there will be you, a different. It, when you get into all of the metrics that we can use at Chaos, it becomes a much richer story, I think. Okay. Uh, because you can look at governance and a metrics model for whether or not this project is receiving enough support from the people who maintain it. So what is the age of the issues on average? How many of the pull requests are being closed? How many of the issues are being closed? Um, are there any pull requests coming in? Are there any pull requests being accepted at all? How many committers are you getting? How recently have they been making commits? Like, are you getting any more forks? There's ways that we can measure this to show if there is any activity or if that activity died out around a particular time and was that from the community was that from the maintainers was that maybe because there's a really high elephant factor that one organization was doing the majority of the work like these are all things that we can measure and i think that there's not really a way to to use what i believe to be a leading indicator which is if there's no versions being released 
uh, and the most recent version is very old, then that can be an indicator that there's something up with the project. And I think like the age of the most recent release is like a thing that I call obsolescence because it helps encapsulate that old problem. And you can be naive and, and just measure it as just the age. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Rami, Remy, sorry, had your hand up. Yeah, I, you, uh, you covered more ground. I really like your basket of indicators. Uh, I think lib years is a good start for how we start to determine what might be obsolescent or at least what's out of date. But I, I think coming up with a basket or a bundle of indicators like elephant factor above a certain amount maintainer number below a certain amount, PR languish above a certain amount. You know, yeah. you can put a lot of those together and come up with some kind of obsolescence indicator that would be more rich than just like lib years because sometimes like open source projects not having releases means that they are really stable and that's not yes. enough of a of an indicator by itself. Totally. And I, I really appreciate you bringing that up because it's something that um, I think as we've tried to adopt viability, which is where I pulled all of those metrics out of, I, I also put them in that viability basket of the metrics model. Um, it's using the context around those numbers, as well as the numbers themselves to try to tell a story of, is this a viable component or is this something that we shouldn't be using? And I think that is one of the edge cases that we need to figure out how to measure appropriately of like, was there just a lot of, a lot of things happening and then it suddenly stopped and what other indicators could we use when that happens to say this is a maintained stable component because uh, I think one of my favorite examples of this is that there's an npm module that translates um, the existing webkit colors like when you if you've ever used html and you say like aqua and it's like that particular hex um, that translates into a JavaScript object just with an NPM package that's been around since they changed it, which was in like 2010 or something like that. And so there's nothing to do on the package. It does what you need it to do, and it does something very basic. So it's not obsolete just because it's 12 years old or 15 years old. It does what it needs to do. And how do you then show that compared to everything else, you know? Um, getting those numbers doesn't mean and delete everything that's in the lowest 20%. I think it just means gives you an idea and you're aware of it so that you can have that dialogue across the organization. But yeah, absolutely. All right. Another hand up. I'm sorry. Uh, I'm going to completely butcher your name. What, how do you pronounce that? This is me, Salva. Salva. Okay. Thank Salva. you. Yeah. So, um, a good topic. I've been thinking a lot about this lately um, through my work at the CPAN security group. So we're looking at how to address security issues in the CPAN ecosystem. And one of the things there is exactly this, like what, what, when is a project done? When, uh, when is it uh, abandoned uh, and all that stuff. And in my mind, uh, the, the concept of obsolescence is something that strictly belongs in, um, uh, in the user's uh, domain. Uh, it's something you define according to your needs. Uh, you need mm -hmm. a strategy to, choose, to move from one platform to another, for example, because it's easier to find developers in that platform, or it could be for some whatever reason. So, um, uh, but the interesting thing for me, from my perspective, since CPAN isn't like the, the bastion of uh, open source software as it used to be like 15 years ago, um, is that uh, when it comes to open source, it, it kind of lives and breathes on contributions. So if uh, a business says this component hasn't had any activity or whatever metrics they use, I just lost video and audio. Did anybody else? Okay. Same here. We'll wait a couple. Wait a couple seconds. Same here. Mm, uh, it's not a 
the, the, picking a, a vocabulary that describes Salva, I'm, I'm sorry, we just lost you for a few seconds. Um, we heard okay, you sorry. talking about like community things where contributions come in, and that's something that you care about a lot. Uh, can you pick up your thoughts from there so we can get the whole narrative of where you were no, going? With that? No, no. <laughs> what? Peculiar, do you, do you mind? Me? Yeah, we can hear you. Peculiar, do you mind uh, muting between? I think you were just talking to somebody yeah. else, maybe. All right. Um, so so I'll, I'll try to summarize a bit. Um, the the community bits, um, the, like the soft, the the open source projects out there, they live and breathe on contributions, and mm -hmm. um, uh, the sometimes and, and in my experience, quite the, quite often, uh, it's uh, uh, the the fact that the, a, uh, a component that is in use in a business isn't being updated can very well be a, a, a question of motivation or being sick of working out on something and not getting any feedback or uh, having negative uh, responses uh, from uh, uh, users that don't know how to interact well with the maintainers, stuff like that. Um, so um, I'm a bit wary. And what I'm trying to communicate is that if we think in a black and white manner, this is old or this is not old, mm -hmm. um, it, it can re, uh, result in uh, black or white decisions. We should drop it or we should continue. Uh, when there are quite a lot of real and meaningful other options, including funding, uh, setting a, one of the internal developers to help the project a little bit, find other ways to help it, which is like one of the things that uh, I've been uh, um, working on with the uh, sustainability working group the, for the, the uh, Cyclone DX uh, S bomb standard that they were having a meeting like in half an hour on this specific topic. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so, so there are a bunch of things that uh, uh, this signal, the, whether or not something is obsolete, should lead to. But uh, obsolete, when you use that word, it, it sounds like uh, this, is a, this is a signal that everybody should run away in panic. And that's not something that any open source project out there is interesting in 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 uh, either creating or or um, or being subject to. Uh, so, in a sense, what I'm hoping here is, can we find a way to communicate that something isn't maintained as well as one would hope that in a, such a way that you get constructive mm -hmm. contributions instead of just uh, running away in panic? Yeah, I think, it, I think it totally makes sense. And I, I have a follow-up I'd love to follow this thought with you, if you don't mind waiting a moment, Damien, or Damien, sorry. Um, so as we think about uh, what needs to be brought to the forefront when we're talking not just about research and folks who I think are very engaged in open source, uh, this was something that was generally pretty easy to understand for folks who aren't engaged in what an open source community does, what a committer community does, what a strategic framework for a project looks like, and pretty understandably easier to collect than scraping GitHub and processing metrics and comparing those apples to apples one to another. And that's part of why I think it's an interesting like case of should this be something that we measure? Should this be something that we use? Because it is something that folks understand a lot better from the outside looking in, where I worry about uh, the very valid concern, by the way, that I agree with, that something more appropriate, like gauging the maintainership or the community or the overall strategy or the documentation of a given project, probably gives you a richer understanding of why the release schedule is the way that it is, or why committers may have come and gone because there was some licensing change, something like that. There's a lot more to tell from the story. Um, and I want to kind of probe your thoughts on, um, as you mentioned, this being part of the story, not like something that you show in isolation. 
do you think that it has no value by itself or do you think that it's something that you want to also make clear is not the entire story when you present it if you were to present it of course yeah um i i think that the the clue to look for here is the presence of nuances mm -hmm. um if you say something is good or something is bad that is that that information carries uh that it's a, that it carries value it's a valuable piece of information but it doesn't tell you anything more than that and and i get it that for a large enterprise that uh, depends maybe on tens or thousands of open source projects uh, cannot operate on a nuanced level uh, without a lot of attention being spent on it um maybe too much attention or, or it becomes very quickly expensive um you kind of still have to have it because it, 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 what we do uh, if we are going to uh, just look at the the over the, the like the, the surface level information is it done or not is it uh, uh has it had so many commit uh, uh or commits or, or pull requests in the last uh, month uh, then you you're you're actually avoiding the one thing that is the lifeblood as i said and that's people who care mm -hmm. it, it, it's the caring of somebody's common uh, open source like it's a commons you have to think about the tragedy of the commons that in the sense that no yeah we don't get the the, the thing that you everybody with too many users uh, deplete a resource as uh, with the tragedy of commons but you can kind of get the opposite of it if there are nobody who is using it or nobody who is interacting with the community they, it's it's impossible to know if that's because there are no users or because people don't care. So the act of caring and communicating and contributing is insanely important. And yeah, if we don't do that, then we're kind of optimizing ourselves away from the lifeblood of the open source community. There's things that make it work, and yeah. that doesn't last. That's a non-sustainable way of thinking. And I don't think any business who has an interest of staying around, like uh, uh, they need to think about sustainability too in this sense. And, and, and I get it, not all businesses can think like that because they have just limited resources or they have a VC funding round that they need to live some ex up to some expectations. But that the rest of us who have the time to care and, and use software, that is valuable to us, we kind of have to find a way to care. And, and yep. if we don't. Yeah, and I, th I think, uh, I, I, I want to get to Damien's question, so I'm, I'm going to keep this brief and I won't uh, cut any of the very valid topics and very valid criticisms and concerns I think you brought up. We do have to care about the fact that open source is not all about relegation to metrics. Uh, that said, in the community, health analytics for open source software uh ospo meeting i think we are talking also about some metrics we can use to find indicators for that and i think there is a level of getting folks who manage money to understand that there is a problem that is big enough that even with metrics we need to start caring about this in a different way it can't just be and we use the best ones only there will be times that it's a, it's worth investing into a project that's strategically important but maybe needs help and without showing there's some numbers behind that i think that's like the sneaky hopefully part of this whole effort is that we can also encourage some spending um, encourage some contributing back and encourage some money usage from companies who can very obviously afford to do that um damian i want to give you a chance uh, to raise your hand and ask that question and you're on mute. Uh, I just wanted to comment uh, about something that um, what we were talking about the using life leap years, and mm -hmm. I think it was uh, David that mentioned it that if a project gets stale, maybe it's a very stable project, it doesn't change anymore. 
uh, even the most stable project that exists uh, will have an increase in leap years by dependencies that will be very, very, very big weird. Like if something is abandoned, the dependencies will not change. If something is stable, the dependencies will keep update. Uh, so that's some kind of flag. Uh, mm -hmm. However, I, I wanted to also mention because on also the previous topic, uh, in my work, we don't care about all this. Uh, it's a concern of the security team, mostly all these things. Uh, we try to keep things legal. We don't try to keep them secure because that's not our main role. Um, and we interact with them, but the authority is usually in security when it depends. So it, it is about the reasons for making something obsolete, end of life, or considering it vulnerable and removing. Uh, it's not on, on the OSPO concern, mm -hmm. at least here. Yeah. No, I mean, that's totally fair. It's not something I think... Uh, there's a lot of things OSPOs can do, and uh, judging the usefulness of everybody's dependencies across the organization doesn't have to be part of, or I guess the viability doesn't have to be part of the function for it to be a useful and functional OSPO. Yeah, but in particular, I think it's a very big overlap with any infosec concern when you are in a company that has an infosec, mm -hmm. and they will be the authority on on that. We can sell, tell things like, License change. This is not open source anymore. Please don't use it. But uh, things like this is insecure or obsolete or it right. put us all in danger is something that usually InfoSec will do. Yeah, I think that that makes sense. And I think um, I know that we partner pretty heavily with the security teams, uh, almost as trying to reduce the feeling that everything is a crisis when it comes out of a security organization. Because a lot of times you get a CVE and it's critical or it's even medium and it's like, you need to patch this yesterday. Um, if we can find some way to uh, head that off before it happens, um, that would be a great way for us to contribute some value and allow people to stay more on track rather than being interrupt driven. And I think that segues pretty well into end of service life. If Folks don't have more to chat about with obsolescence. I'd love to use that momentum to talk about end of service life a little bit. Alan, go ahead. Can you hear me? Yep. If an organization is concerned about the fact that the project can be unmaintained or not maintained properly, they can also mm -hmm. assign some developer that can lead or help absolutely the open source communities so it, it's not only about money it in most cases it's just one poor maintainer that it's overworked mm -hmm. yeah and i think um i'm gonna point to that panel discussion that uh we're gonna try to discuss how this relates to oss viability with metrics merges and money um getting people to contribute back by trying to use these as leading indicators is definitely something i believe in Thank you for yeah, helping me you. reinforce that that's useful. Um, uh, Salva, go ahead. Yeah, um, I'll be very quick. Um, specifically on this topic uh, in the OSA Sustainability Working Group at Cosac and DX, we are trying to create a, a taxonomy of types of ways to contribute. I know there is uh, for businesses or for anybody that is not money uh, that could be anything um mm -hmm. uh, so so this is partly based on what the chaos you guys have done earlier but it's an expanded list and the point there is to have this introduced into the cyclone dx s bomb standard in such a way that maintainers can communicate what kind of things they need in such a way that businesses of those can see if it matches with some of the resources they have internally and thereby help the, the community and, and the components uh, maintainers and the projects in a, in a non-monetary way which sometimes is more useful and more valuable than just sending money so yeah that's, absolutely 
that's in the meeting in uh, half an hour, by the way. So if you're anyone that is interested in specifically this topic, then please join me. All right. Uh, thanks for dropping that link. I see that there too. Uh, appreciate it. That is your call to join that conversation if you're interested. Uh, I don't think I have the time, unfortunately. It sounds like a very rich thing that I would love to be a part of, but I have a conflict. Um, and I see, I think this was either Elizabeth or Sean. Uh, the research OSS Enterprise does that. The I That's also me. think that the research, okay, go ahead, Sean. I'm gonna try and to I, say it again, but I'll fail. Yeah, it just, there. there is a case where in the research space, and I think the folks who are there know this, projects stop for six months or a year while the cycles of funding renew. And so that stoppage reduces all the metrics, but it doesn't have this, it's not signaling the same thing as it is in a corporate sense, in a corporate context, where somebody's either maintaining it or not because it's kind of moving forward in perpetuity. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think so. And I think it's important to have different timeframes that we view these metrics for that reason mm -hmm. of like all time, two years, one year, six months, three months, depending on what you want to look at. Yeah, M metrics are not a like permanent, but they, I guess they don't apply this in the same manner to every project. And that's just always important to keep in mind, I think. Yeah, and Damian mentions uh, also the gap between graduation and the next PhD student. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, same thing, yes. Yeah. Very Similar important. Phenomena. Very important. Um, Awesome. Well, that was a great conversation. Thanks, everybody, for sharing your thoughts. Uh, I'm going to segue into end of service life, where we've talked quite a bit about um, suitability, I think, viability for these components over time. And uh, I think as we spoke about security teams and kind of enforcement of here's a CVE, you must stop using this component now. End of service life is uh, yet another leading indicator that we're considering as something that we should be looking at and, and messaging out as part of the open source program office, because cybersecurity teams may not be tracking end of service life. Folks may not understand what end of service life means without some level of education, unless there's open source advocacy about what that can mean and what that what risk that provides to your application. Uh, one that I want to point out specifically is spring five. Earlier this year was supposed to be end of service life um, by the end of this year. So as of right now, you'd have another month and a half to get off of it. And then they just uh, got acquired by Broadcom and changed that date to, uh, I think it was August 30th. So either 30th or 31st. So suddenly you have almost two less quarters to get off of this version. Um, and four or five CVEs have already been posted for spring five. So if you're using previous versions of Java architecture, then you have to change what version of Java you might be using to upgrade to the most recent spring. Uh, and I think, I don't know that this is being collected in an open way. Uh, it seems like something that you generally have to pay for. Open Hub from Synopsys has some of this data, but not necessarily printed out as easily as, um, Oh, hey, uh, Safa, you might be able to jump in with something interesting. Um, there, I see you're posting about OWASP. And I thought, like, I know that this is a this is a big sticking point for us. We're thinking about end of life and how we collect that data. And we're fortunate enough to have some teams we can partner with to make that happen. But I thought it was something that maybe if other folks are thinking about how we're thinking about it, maybe we can do it in a more open way than this end of life dot date, which feels like it has some data, but maybe not as much as we need. Yeah, I'll just jump in and say uh, um, I've been to a few of the um, uh, common lifecycle enumeration meetings, and they speak exactly of this topic. And they took and they look at the broad range of nuances uh, in this. For example, when it comes to medical devices, there's an aftermarket type of uh, activity mm -hmm. that needs to be uh, communicated well. Um, uh, when it comes to legislation, for example, uh, in the Cyber Resilience Act in Europe uh, demands coming will, will demand that uh, uh, patches of security updates are supposed to be available for five years after the end of support period, uh, and all the, all of these types of um, details make it into, of course, a mess. But it needs to be communicated and. Luckily, there's at least one community out there uh, in all of us that actually tries to 
get a create a full overview of this so um and it's still open for contributions so if any of you care about this topic i'm sure they're happy to see you there also yeah i see their github is just one file that says specification for this yeah there's there there's um a bit more to that uh, and okay. the main main the document is a google docs document uh with got it quite a bit of stuff in it Oh, okay. Yeah, now I see. Awesome. A wealth of fantastic cross-functional uh, kind of initiatives coming out this meeting. Thanks for sharing. Uh, I'm going to just take a second to make sure this makes its way into the notes. Anybody else want to chime in about end of service life, end of life, how we approach it? How it affects your organization. All right. Uh, are we talking about products or open source components or both or anything? Uh, I think in this conversation we're talking about open source components, but there might be some overlap between how we do both, and that's yeah. totally but fair game. Yeah, that's that. Uh, that's kind of related then to our previous discussion. But uh, like you have the possibility for nuances also here. For example, instead of saying it's an end of life type of situation, but rather it's a casually maintained situation that it's not gone. People haven't left, but uh, um, if there's a problem, sure we'll fix it. The kind of situation. Mm -hmm. So. Um, that might be worth also taking into account. Um, yeah, th this really, uh, I think EOSL usually applies to like big projects, right? Of like, they have to have some version and support system because there's just 5,000 users, 10,000 users that they move to a different version of Java because that's what you have to do to keep up. They, we're going to deprecate this one. We're not doing security fixes for this one anymore. I definitely think... Um, when we start getting to smaller projects that are like, I think, as I mentioned, like web colors or even left pad or whatever, you can't expect an end of service life to be associated with that necessarily. All right. Um, Remy, I assume you put this next one in, new guidance and CMS gov OSPO guide. Yep. I think I had mentioned in a, a previous meeting that we were looking at two specific areas, uh, archival of uh, repositories and uh, 508 compliance. And so we have some early versions of those uh, guides that are part of our OSPO guide repo. Uh, the OSPO guide repo is still very early on. Uh, we are going to continue developing it out, but you know, release early, release often. We'd rather get our stuff out there into the community. So um, those are linked to in the agenda. Um, we will be uh, looking into how we can bring more data and metrics into making some of these decisions around archival guidance, especially. Um, that's gonna be continuing to get built out in the coming quarters as we build out our source code stewardship task force and our, our metrics project. Um, and then the, the accessibility stuff I think is a, is a little bit, um, I haven't heard as much about accessibility metrics within the, the chaos community. So I think that one is going to be a little bit more closely related to like existing efforts with like WCAG and some of the other communities. But if there are existing chaos metrics or other utilities that we could bring there for plain language and 508 compliance, uh, we would definitely you know, be happy to take that input and include it in our, in our guide. We wanted to share it with everybody else so you can see what we're doing too. Absolutely. Yeah. That's worth checking out. All right. Uh, we're getting pretty close to time here. So I think we can get towards uh, the reminders and the announcements. So holiday schedule for chaos meetings. There's not going to be any US based chaos meetings the week of November 25th. Uh, there's not going to be any meetings December 9th to January 6th. So the last meeting of the year uh, is going to be December 12th for this one. 
Um, no, and then, the last meeting oh, sorry. is technically, sorry, the last meeting is technically today, right now, unless oh, okay. we decide to have another on December 12th. So, just I'm want glad to throw that you're here. <laughs> I would have shown up on December 12th if uh, you hadn't. I mean, you still there. can. I yeah. just would need to add it back to the calendar, so. Yeah, that's okay. Um, do folks feel strongly, would you like to keep this meeting for the 12th? Would we like to have this discussion again, or are we okay to take a break until January? I'm going to assume silence means we'll meet again in January. All right, there we go. So no strong feelings that we need to keep this meeting for uh, the 12th. All right, uh, chaos con call for papers is open until December 17th. Uh, and this is for the EU, uh, probably co-located with another event, maybe? Yeah, with FOSDEM. Okay. It's so two with days FOSDEM, before FOSDEM, yeah. Got it. So if you're going to FOSDEM or if you're going to be in the area, um, absolutely check that out. Also, sponsorship opportunities. Uh, tell your boss, tell your people, sponsor. Chaos is great. Um, and then, the Elizabeth, do you want to talk about the Chaos Community Survey? Yes, I would love to. We have one more day. We would really love your input. We um, would just like your voices, diverse voices. So this group um, is also obviously included in that. We would really love if you could just take a couple minutes and just tell us about your experience here at Chaos. So. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, no worries. Uh, thanks, everybody. Please fill that out. Uh, we will see you again in January. And until then, uh, keep it, keep it real. I wish I had a better sign off, but have a great holiday and I'll see you again in the new year. Thank Bye, you. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone.